over the crowd. All right. Well, it is good to be together. I am Pastor Daniel. I want to welcome you all to worship here this morning. I want to welcome those that are joining us online and also those that are gathered here in person for this time of worship. Our hope, our prayer is that today that we've intentionally gathered in this place to gather around our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I mean, that's why we exist as a church. So through that time, our hope and our prayer is that he embraces us all. And in that embrace that we receive and experience his love and his grace in its fullest. Amen again? Amen. Amen. Well, I do have some important little tidbits to share with you, important tidbits. We are currently collecting items for the United Methodist Women's Rummage Sale. That rummage sale is at the end of July, so we still do have a little bit of time. But if you do have some things that you would like to donate, uh, we are currently collecting those. The money that will be made from that will be going towards the building fund or mortgage fund. So it's always a, a great great outreach and you know folks get some good deals and it's a good time of fellowship so again end of july is when that is tomorrow night is when our ad council will be meeting on may the 17th at seven o'clock right here in the sanctuary we got a lot of important stuff to discuss everything from the covid protocols to the new sound system so it'll be a great time Corey's pretty excited about the new sound system back there in the back no one got to see that but me anyhow yes <laughs> So tomorrow night be a great night to, to continue to just pray and plan together for our mission and vision of our church. Our next blood drive is this Thursday from 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock. It might be more like 2.20, but the, through the email that I sent out on Thursday, you can find a link uh, to be able to sign up for that. As of Thursday, there were plenty of spots open, tons of spots open. So if it has been past your like 53 or 54 day mark and you're able to give blood, you know, prayerfully consider uh, joining that so that we can continue to help save lives. We as a church, it literally through the blood drives that we've had, have literally helped save hundreds and hundreds of lives uh, over the course of this past year. Every month we have had blood drives and even sometimes we had two. Uh, so this has been a, a way for us to continue to reach out into our community, even during this last year. So, and with all that, let us stand this more. Oh, one last thing. Before I forget, I saw Lee. I felt Lee's eyes looking at me. After service today, we will have a brief trustees meeting. Brief trustees meeting, and that will be in the, uh, in the fellowship hall. Okay. In the adult study. Yes, in the place that we met last time. And with that, let us stand for this morning's call to worship, Majesty. Father, we come before you this morning worshiping your son, the King of Kings, and we pray that through this time of worship that you would just fill our lives to the point of overflowing with your love and God with your grace. 
Father, we pray that as we are glorifying your name, as we are hearing your word, we pray that you would do a work of grace within our hearts, within our minds, and within our lives. God, we pray that this day and through this time of worship, that we would be a people that become just a little bit more loving and people just a little bit more like your son. And all God's people said, amen. Let's continue singing by singing victory in Jesus. Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
may be seated. This morning, do we have any good news that we'd like to share with one another? I always love to hear good news and what God is up to and the good things that are happening in our lives. Anyone at all like to share some good news? Yes, Mark? Ah, it's great news, Mark. Yes. Mark just shared that he had a test on his heart and the results had come back good. And that is great news. That is great news. Yes, yes. Yes. Man, that's not fair. Ah, I, did, I should have done that. Yes. Luann just shared that she bought her husband a three-foot-tall tomato plant to get a head start on the rest of us. So, yeah. Well, well played. Well played. Yes. Anything else? Yeah, there in the back. Absolutely, absolutely. Sarah just shared that uh, saw uh, Nate, uh, your nephew, correct, nephew, and uh, he had had a uh, pretty massive stroke a few weeks back, but he is home, which is a, that's a huge blessing, uh, and he does have a way for uh, for recovery still, but uh, it is great news that he he uh, had ma has made it home. Absolutely. Anything else? Yeah, Jim. That's right. Jim just wanted to share a, a thanks to uh, all those that came out yesterday and helped with our cleanup day around the church. It definitely went well. And and uh, yes, indeed, all of you that were able to help. Thank you. Thank you. Here in the front. Awesome. Wanda just shared that her sister from California is here and uh, been able to spend some time with mom. So that is great news. Yes. Yes, indeed. And welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Yes, indeed. It is. It is definitely. Yes. Uh, Jill just shared that uh, a joy that Regina is back in the house. Yes. So it is good to see you, Regina. Yes. Yes, indeed. And anything else? Anything else? Any prayer concerns that we may want to share with one another? Any prayer concerns? Yeah. Definitely. Prayers for Uncle Missy's Uncle Ron, who has Parkinson's. Looks like maybe he had a, had a stroke and uh, just uh, hard to tell at this point, but definitely prayers for him. Yeah, Corey? Definitely, definitely. Corey just shared a uh, prayer concern for a uh, family member named Tasha, and she is in the hospital with COVID currently. And while staying there, uh, they discovered a spot on her kidney, and it is operable, uh, but definitely prayers for her and the rest of the family. Absolutely. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes. Definitely, definitely. Luann just shared her mom, Jan, uh, is in the hospital, and uh, she got through her first round of chemo, but is in the hospital due to dehydration. So definitely prayers for her. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, there in the back. Max Bennett, prayers for him. And then Jay, was it Growler? Browler. Definitely prayers for both of them. And also, if you do have an unspoken prayer concern, you can just lift that up by simply lifting your hand. And I think we all probably have an unspoken or two in our lives. Well, let's turn to our Lord in prayer.
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, this morning we come before you looking to you as the great healer and the author of life. Lord, we recognize your word to be true and your word tells us that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, Lord Jesus, this morning we pray that you would reach out and bring healing to the lives of those that have been mentioned and those, that God, that are on our hearts. Father, we pray for those families that are grieving, and we ask, God, that you would wrap your loving arms around them and share with them your love and, God, your grace. Lord, this morning for those that are sick, battling COVID, battling cancer, battling whatever kind of sickness, whatever kind of illness. And we just pray, God, that you would lead them to the place of healing, whether it's a miraculous touch of your hand, whether it's to the doctor's office, whether it's to the hospital. We just pray, God, that you would bring healing to those that are battling illness. Father, this morning, for all those that are in our community that aren't in a relationship with your son, this morning, Father, we especially pray. And we pray that, God, that you would open their hearts, open their minds, open their lives by your grace to the possibility of what it would look like to be in a relationship with your son, Jesus. Lord, this morning we pray that we, as a church, would continue to be your light within this community. God, we pray that the light that you share forth from us would shine brighter than it's ever shown before. And we pray that we as a congregation could be a beacon of hope to those around us of what a community of people that are surrounded around your son, what, we could, what it could truly look like. This morning, Father, we pray that you just continue to be with our nation. We pray that you would be with our nation's leaders. And we pray that, God, that through the decisions and through everything that's happening, that, God, that you would just impart your wisdom. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. strength when I am weak. You are my treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all my shame 
rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, again Jesus Jesus Lamb of God worthy is your name Jesus Lamb of God worthy is your name that song, Tim. Thank you, thank you. That song was uh, one of the songs that I, uh, I remember singing when I first came to know Christ at the age of 18, 19 years old, almost 20, 21 years ago now. And uh, by the grace of God, I still believe those words. Yes. And, uh, you know, I don't know, it just took me back to that time and singing. And, and, you know, I'd grown up in church and I'd been around church. My dad's a pastor. My grandpa's a pastor. And, and so, you know, I, I'd, I'd heard and I'd heard and I'd heard about this Jesus but it wasn't really until I was about 18 or 19 years old that I actually knew him. And then singing those songs that we sang every week in church just took on a whole new, whole new meaning. And uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that song there, Tim. So today's uh, message is, uh, is uh, continued in the same vein as we have been in. Uh, there's only going to be one more of these. But uh, this is a Gospel According to Winnie the Pooh. And uh, today is an Eeyore perspective. An Eeyore perspective. And eventually we'll work our way around to Luke chapter 10-ish is where we will end up. A story is told about a man who found out it was his time to go to heaven. He asked the Lord if he could bring just one thing. The Lord said no. Finally, after many requests, the Lord said, you can bring one thing. Happily, the man packed his suitcase full of gold. When he arrived in heaven, the angel said, sorry, you can't bring that in here. And he said, the Lord said I could. Okay, they said. By the way, what's in there anyway? The man opened the bag, and the angels looked in. And then an angel said, oh, it's pavement. The power of perspective. In her column, Ask Marilyn, Marilyn Voss Savant gave an interesting perspective on contentment. One reader wrote in about a unique experiment she had conducted after being dissatisfied that her neighbor's yard looked better than her own. She did what few had done and walked next door to look back at her own grass. When she stood in her neighbor's yard, the grass in her own now looked greener than theirs. So she asked, why does this occur? Marilyn replied, the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence because you're not close enough to see the dirt. Most of the time, things look better for others simply because we can't see their dirt. The power of perspective. Samuel Bringle was a worker with the Salvation Army in Boston many years ago. As he passed by a saloon, some men threw a brick at his head. Their aim was good, and Bringle nearly died. As it was, he spent 18 months in recovery. During that time, he wrote a little book entitled, Helps to Holiness. Thousands of copies were published. After he was able to begin preaching again, people would often thank him for the book. He would respond by saying... If there had been no little brick, there had been no little book. His wife saved the brick and had Genesis 50, 20 engraved on it. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. The power 
of perspective. You know, in this final example, the power of perspective, wouldn't it have been awfully easy for the man pelted in the head with a brick to become bitter by the injustice that was done to him? It had been all so easy for him to spend the rest of his days living in a state of, woe is me, woe is me for what life has done to me. Wouldn't it have been easy for him to allow the cruelty that was dished out by others into his life for him, for the rest of his days, to look at his life grimly? I'll never forget today that an old man told me, and a friend of mine, he said, in life you can become bitter. Or in life, you can become better. Those words were spoken to me and my friend while his granddaughter was in the adjacent room on life support from the wreck that the friend with me had unintentionally caused. In life, you can become better, he said. Tears in his eyes. He said, in life, you could also become better. The man pelted by a brick chose the latter. And use the difficulties in life as an opportunity for growth. And through that growth became a blessing to other people. Where he was able to help others to become better as he had become better and not bitter. Perspective is a powerful thing. It can cause us in the face of real difficulties to become weighed down, bogged down with the difficulties of life. Or our perspective can cause us in the midst of those same difficulties to grow. And become a little more the people that God had been calling us since our conception to be. Difficult situations can be seen as opportunities for God to use for our good in our life. Or they can be seen as just another example of how hard life can be. Our attitude determined by our perspective has everything to do with whether we throughout life become better through the hand dealt to us, or bitter through the cards that aren't in our hands. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Some of us, we age like fine wine. And others, we age like milk. <laughs> wine or milk. Bitter or better. It's on us to decide. Well, our good friend Eeyore from the Hundred Acre Wood... He can teach us much about the power of perspective. Check out this clip from the real life movie of the Hundred Acre Wood entitled Christopher Robin. Check this out. Just my luck, a heffalump, leering at his lunch. Eeyore, I'm not a heffalump. Doesn't matter anyway. Headed for the waterfall. I'll be gone soon. Oh no, not the waterfall. Swim! Not that anyone will notice. Swim, swim, swim! Just have to go with the flow. Don't worry. I'm not. Can't change the inevitable. Mustn't give up at all. I'll save you. We'll see. Oh, yes, of course. I've grown up, haven't I? <laughs> oh, heal! Laughing at my misfortune. Just like a heffalump. Hello, Eeyore. Hello, heffalump. Not a heffalump. I'm Christopher Robin. Do you remember I used to try and cheer you up? I don't remember being cheery. <laughs> the power of perspective. Old Eeyore, as Christopher Robin said, he used to spend his days attempting... To make Eeyore cheery, but old Eeyore's perspective was one that was just devoid of the possibility of cheer. And as he put it himself, he doesn't ever remember being cheerful. The lens, the perspective that we look at life with, it determines whether we as people living through real difficulties can be people of cheer or people of sorrow, people of hope. Or people of despair. Which brings us in a bit of a U-turn kind of like way to our passage this morning. It's a passage in part about the power of perspective. But it's spinning this whole topic a bit differently. 
invite you to stand with me this morning for the reading, this portion of the reading of God's Word together. This comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 29 through 35. I think you'll recognize it. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he too passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we just ask in this time of, this continued time of worship, through this time of teaching and preaching, that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word. We pray that you, Holy Spirit, would take these times of thinking, these times of thoughts, these times of having emotion, God, and use them, use them to bring about some transformation in our lives. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. May be seated. May have a seat. The all so familiar, famous passage of the Good Samaritan. And oh, what it can teach us about perspective. A man lay on the side of the road, literally left by robbers for dead. Many a passerby passed this man right on by, laying on the side of the road, barely holding on to life. What many people saw was not a fellow human being in need, it was not someone that was made in the image and likeness of God worthy of love and respect was not someone that was more like themselves than they thought. It was not someone whom was worth their notice, and especially not worth their time. What many people saw was a difficult situation rather than an opportunity to do some good. What many people saw was an inconvenience to their day rather than a person that needed some help. Something that has become sadly apparent to me is that we as federal citizens of this great country are by the day seeing each other less and less and less. It was a couple weeks ago when Sarah had taken Luke to Meyer. Luke recently had just discovered in his 14-month-old self that he can, in fact, wave to people. <laughs> what he discovered in our home is that when he decides to wave to people, is he usually gets a response, a response. Some, uh, maybe a, a wave in reciprocation or maybe a laugh, right? You know? So he loves the wave now. He's, he's, he's a waving baby. That trip to Meyer, though, was a sad one. For as Luke waved and waved and waved and waved, not a single fellow shopper even took notice of him. He wasn't lying on the side of the road half dead, thank the good Lord. <laughs> he was a happy little baby. But just like this poor man from our passage, he was not seen by others and was passed on by on the other side as he waved. So who passed by this wounded man from our passage? First, you had the priest. The priest would have been the obvious hero in the tale. I mean, priests were seen in a positive light in the first century. They were people who embodied through their lives the way of God. They, they were the morally upright lot of society. They were the ones that people expected to live well and to treat others well. And I'm sure when the hearers of this parable heard that the priest did not help this man, that the priest was not the neighbor, well, I'm sure there would have been an audible gasp. <gasps> How could that be? Jesus. Now the priest saw the wounded man, as the scripture said, but he didn't really see the wounded man. He more than likely used the lens, that is, saw this man through the perspective that the man may be dead. And if he were dead and the priest, if he were to touch him, or even get near to him, well then he would be labeled unclean. And, and that would just put a serious damper on his day. I mean, the priest had important priestly duties to fulfill. and did not have the time to deal with this pile 
of rags on the side of the road. His perspective kept him from tending. His perspective kept him from loving. It kept him from seeing this situation as an opportunity to do some real good in another person's life. His perspective caused him to just pass on by. Again, perspective is a powerful thing. Then you have the Levite come along, whom Jesus' audience probably again were expecting him to be the hero. Show that priest what's up, right? <laughs> to show what it means to, to be another's neighbor, you know? But the Levite did just as a priest. He saw but did not see. Maybe he had a busy day planned. Maybe he was in a hurry. Maybe he saw this man as a priest did. Whatever lens he used, it too caused him to pass the wounded, dying man right on by. We today as a society are beginning not to see each other. Just like the priest and the Levite did not see the wounded man. The reasoning for us is obviously different. But the cracked lens, the smeared lens, the ill-advised perspective that we are seeing each other through is causing us to pass each other by more and more. Things like fear. Things like COVID. Things like what we see on TV, read in the papers, read in our news feed. It's causing us to lose clear and accurate perspectives of each other. So much so that we sometimes, even ourselves, can't see a baby play. Perspective. It's a powerful thing. But back to our passage. And then the most unlikely of heroes is introduced. A Samaritan. <laughs> the audience of Jesus' parable, well, we'll just say some of them would have been extremely offended that Jesus would pick such a character to be the hero of the story. I would even suspect that some of them, even before the explanation came, churned and stormed away in their offense. As I've made mention in many messages over the years, the relationship between Jews and Samaritans was beyond toxic, beyond volatile. They were their greatest enemy, even more so than the Romans. Using a Samaritan as the hero, he was gutsy. He was telling his first century hearers, and this is very important, he was telling them that each other is not the enemy. That, that looking at each other through that perspective was part of their problem and was a good deal of the reason as to why they lived in constant state of conflict with their neighbors and physical proximity, the Samaritans. Jews, as N.T. Wright teaches, believed that their only true neighbor were fellow Jews. Jesus, in this parable, was bursting this bubble big time. He was telling them that these people whom they had been in actual conflict with since the Babylonian exile, which was centuries ago, should not be seen as their enemy, but as their neighbor, and therefore someone whom they should, like their fellow Jew, love. Folks would have been fuming. You've been in a room before where something is said, and it just causes the temperature of the room to go from like 70 to 90. That's what this whole parable and teaching would have felt like. The audacity. See, it's always been easier for us as people to love people that think like us, that believe like us, that vote like us, that look like us. Then it is to love people that are just flat out different than we are. But at the heart of the parable, that is what Jesus was teaching. That it is important and necessary to using some of our language from last week to be a people willing to reach across the aisle, willing to reach across the pew, and willing to reach across the table to love people no matter who they are no matter what they've done no matter what their lifestyle is no matter what and that is the truth that's at the heart of the
was terrible. Martin Luther King Jr., he said this all so well when he said, we've learned to fly the air like birds. We've learned to swim the seas like fish. And yet we haven't learned to walk the earth as brothers and sisters. Jesus was pushing back against the cultural and societal norms by including the most loathed and hated person to the Jew, the Samaritan, in this parable. He did so to challenge the people to see these loathed individuals through a different lens. The lens of commonality. The lens of being a brother. The lens of being a sister. The lens of being a neighbor. Instead of the lens of being an enemy. An enemy. See, how it is that we think about others, how it is that we see others, our perspective of others determines whether we are going to love them or hate them, despise them or cherish them. Which brings us to the Samaritan's lens, the Samaritan's perspective. He didn't see the wounded man as someone that could make him unceremonially unclean. He looked at the person as a neighbor, not as an enemy. He, he saw him not as a problem, not as an inconvenience, but as a fellow person who needed some help. His perspective enabled him to stop and see this fellow person rather than to just scurry on Perspective truly is a very powerful thing. We as Americans, we as fellow neighbors, fellow human beings, need to see each other as the Samaritan saw the wounded man. For the perspective, the lens of enemy rather than neighbor that we are being told to look at each other through, it's not working. It's not helping. It's just like it was for the Jews and Samaritans in the first century is why we are living in such conflict with each other and living in fear, in such fear of each other. It's why we are starting to more and more just pass each other by. My friends, that's not how God had created us to be. To go about our lives without really seeing other people. Sarah Groves, a Christian singer, she spins this another way. This comes from an incredible book called Uncommon Ground, and I would recommend it to anyone. But she says this. The Exodus story speaks of a plague of darkness so profound that people could not see one another. It's Exodus chapter 10, verse 23. She says, I think we're fighting a similar darkness now. And we need divine help and wisdom to speak truth while pursuing each other's flourishing. We need divine help in our lives as individuals, in our lives as a society and as a country to clear the fog, to clear the mist from our glasses, to clear the darkness that the plague of COVID-19 and other things in 2020 and 2021 has enshrouded us with so that we can be like the hero in our passage and we can be like the Samaritan and truly take a loving notice of others. Again, perspective, perspective. Spin this one last way. Back to Eeyore. <laughs> you may have noticed from our clip that Eeyore called Christopher Robin something really strange. A heffalump. I kept calling him a heffalump. You may, as I was, be very curious as to what on earth that is. In the movie, Pooh's Heffalump, Tell you what, sermon prep has been interesting these last six weeks. But in the movie, Pooh's Heffalump, the 100-acre woodlot, hears a deep trumpeting sound. They then, in their 100-acre wood-like way, then imagine the creature that made the sound as a terrifying beast, capable of awful, horrific things. So they set out to capture this wicked creature and, and to purge its ilk from their woods. As they set out on their mission, well, Rue, baby Rue, Stumbled upon the beast. He, being filled with the thoughts that his peers and superiors had pumped him full of, was frightened 
He was terrified. He almost lost his fur. But then, then through some simple interaction, through simply communicating, through simply spending time with the supposed wretched creature, he discovers that the others were wrong. That the heffalump wasn't some scary, evil, vile creature full of malice and ill intent, but was an elephant-like person in the animal world, a person just like him. Then as the story goes, the rest of the Hundred Acre Woods still locked onto their perspective of this creature. They caught Rue's friend. And as they were preparing to oust the creature, Rue stood up for the heffalump and he said, You don't understand. We were wrong about heffalumps. They're not scary creatures. Lump is my friend. He's just like us. He likes honey. Pooh loved that. And he even learned to bounce, caused a tear in old Tigger's eye. We need to do the same for our fellow Americans, our fellow immigrants, for our fellow people living in this land. Stop seeing each other through the lens that society, that others, that the world says we should be seeing each other through. And start seeing them as they actually are. As old Fred Rogers would have it, not as enemies, not as people full of ill intent, not as people full of malice, but as neighbors. As neighbors. Whom we, whom we should love. As every single person that we encounter is someone that just like the wounded man on the side of the road, someone in need of something that we as Christians have. Love. Our faith intended to cause us to become more loving people. And the world in which we live is desperately crying out for the love that Christ revealed in his life and the love that his Holy Spirit can actually work through our lives and into others. Fred Rogers said it well. Everyone longs to be loved. And the greatest thing we can do is let people know that they are loved and that they too are capable of loving. So whoever is your Samaritan, whoever is your heffalump, may you by the grace of God swap the lens, swap the perspective that you have been seeing them through for a better, clearer lens. One that will allow you to see them not as your enemy, as someone to be feared and someone to be hated, but as your neighbor, someone to be loved, someone to be cherished. In closing, you may guess this is coming. Perspective is a powerful thing. It can cause us in life to become bitter, or better, to age like milk or fine wine and can even cause us to love or hate, cherish or fear one another. Let's stand as we sing our final hymn together, Pass It On.
today and you know what's amazing is uh tim sent me that you know the the hymn for this morning days before that message was even written and uh finished that is and awesome yeah let's pray together father this day we just thank you that we could gather here as your children as your people and we just pray god that we go forth from this place with that spark of your love within our hearts and we pray that, God, that through the people that we see, that we encounter, that, God, that we wouldn't pass them by, but, God, that we would pass on that love that you have shared with us. And all God's people said, Mr. Jim Turney. Love and treat your neighbor with respect and help them grow with God. Amen. And trustees, don't forget, quick meeting in the uh, that room we met in last time. Mm -hmm. 